All right, uh, no questions. I want to wrap up the chemical reaction stuff uh, here, and then we're going to start 24 and 13. Um, and so if we take something like sodium phosphate, uh, Na3PO4, we have, you know, what are the properties of sodium phosphate? You know, what can you tell me about some of the properties of sodium phosphate? Well, let's start off with the physical properties. What, what do you think? Solid, liquid, gas? I think it is. Say pure sodium phosphate. Solid. It's a solid. Uh, what makes you think it's a solid, or you know for sure? You'd be right. It is a solid, but what made you think it's a solid? Just curious. Hmm? Ionic bonds. Yeah, ionic bonds. Um, you could say ionic bonds. Most ionically bonded solid uh, <laughs> substances like this are solids. Um, in fact, salts. Do you know any salts that are liquids? In normal conditions? No. Do you know any salts that are gases? You haven't encountered any, so most of the salts, in fact, all the salts you've encountered have been solid in pure form. So you could use that. <coughs> it's not ionic bonds. It's pretty strong here. Uh, what else? Uh, physical properties. You know, um, do salts have high melting points or low melting points typically? The melting point varies quite dramatically, but typically you'd say salts are. Yeah, high melting. What else? Strong electrolyte. This is strong electrolyte um, because it's a soluble salt or insoluble salt. This is soluble salt. So sodium salts are soluble, so strong electrolyte should dissociate into ions, sodium ions and phosphate ions. Should be soluble, quite soluble. Group one salts. Uh, Etc. What about chemical properties? Tell me about the chemical properties of sodium phosphate. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, uh, the chemical properties we just do systematically. So, for example, sodium phosphate consists of sodium ions and phosphate ions. And so the first thing is metathesis. Uh, for metathesis, uh, what ions does sodium ions like? Are sodium ions very reactive in metathesis reactions? No. Well, sodium ions are totally unreactive because um, all group one salts are soluble, so it doesn't precipitate it with anything. Are sodium ions a strong acid, weak acid? We don't even consider sodium ions acidic, right? They're neutral. Do sodium ions combine with other things to form gases? No. And so metathesis, uh, sodium ions are unreactive, <coughs> totally unreactive. However, phosphate ions are, are quite reactive with in fact, phosphate will precipitate out with um, what? It's like anything besides group one? Yeah, exactly. Uh, phosphate will precipitate out with any cation except for group one and ammonium. And so it'll react with any, any other cation that's going to precipitate out. And so phosphate's quite reactive in metathesis reactions. And so sodium, nothing. Phosphate, yes. Very reactive. Um, what other types of reactions could sodium phosphate undergo? <coughs> it can undergo acid-base reactions. If we look at um, Bronsted, we'll skip Lewis for now. 
If we look at Bronsted, um, sodium ions. Are sodium ions good proton donors? No, are sodium ions good proton acceptors? Do they want an H plus? No, and so sodium ions we call neutral. You know, those are neither uh, proton acceptors or proton donors. But phosphate, uh, what is phosphate? Can phosphate accept protons? Yeah, and so phosphate's a base. Well, um, well, bases react with acids. So what acids will phosphate react with? Will it react with all acids? All Bronsted acids? No. No. Um, there's a pattern you'll notice when you do start doing these. And that is, if we look at the chart, you know, we have acid strengths. For example, HClO4 is at the top of the chart. Uh, what's the conjugate base of HClO4? ClO4 minus. And uh, we have a list of strong acids all the way down to H3O+. These are the strong acids. Well, the strong acids are strong electrolytes. So they're going to lose the H plus or hydrolyze to form hydronium and um, form the base here. And what we, we're going to say is uh, the strong acids are strong because um, the base here doesn't have much attraction for the H plus. And since the base here doesn't have much attraction for H plus, um, these bases are too weak to hydrolyze water. Bases hydrolyze. Uh, and so we, we consider these neutral because they're so weak. Technically, they're base. Technically, they should accept a proton, but you know, it's not a, a strong attraction between this base and a proton. This is why HClO4 loses a proton so easily. And so we could, we could look at a uh, an acid like HCl and its co uh, conjugate base chloride. And so if we have something like chloride, yes, technically chloride is a, is a base. It can accept a proton to make HCl, right? But when we know when we have HCl in solution, um, they completely separate. And, and so um, we think about this. Yes, it is on the base side of the chart, but it's not much of a base. In fact, if you ran out of, um, let's say you ran out of milk and magnesia or something, and you, you, you need to um, you need some kind of antacid. If you ran out of uh, milk and magnesia, could you substitute table salt as an antacid? Well, you might say, yeah, I could substitute table salt. You know, sodium ions are nothing, neutral, but chloride's a base. And since chloride's a base, it's a proton um, acceptor, and so it should neutralize some of your stomach acid. Will it? Is chloride going to neutralize some of your stomach acid? The answer is no, it's too weak. Too weak. And so this is why we, we consider these neutral, uh, quote unquote. However, um, something like phosphate, phosphate is pretty, pretty strong. It's not quite strong enough to be considered a, a strong base. You know, a strong base would be something like hydroxide, <clears throat> sulfide, you know, oxide, methide, etc., amide. <coughs> Excuse me. These are the strong bases. Now, the strong bases, um, if the weak bases are too weak to hydrolyze water, the strong bases have no problem hydrolyzing water. In fact, the strong bases should do what to water? Do strong bases ionize? You know, strong bases are strong electrolytes. Strong electrolytes ionize 100%, right? And so if I take a strong base like sulfide, what does sulfide ionize into? If sulfide is a strong base, which it is, and strong bases are strong electrolytes, and strong electrolytes ionize completely, then what does sulfide ionize into? Well, you know, what I said is, is wrong because Bases do not ionize. What do bases do? Bases hydrolyze. 
And so if I have something like sulfide, it's going to hydrolyze water 100% to form what? Yeah. It's going to form HS minus and OH minus. In fact, all these strong bases hydrolyze water 100%. And so all these strong bases will form hydroxide. And therefore, we have the leveling effect of strong bases, just like we have the leveling effect of strong acids. The strongest acid that can exist in water is hydronium. What's the strongest base that can exist in water? The strongest base is hydroxide, because if I try to put sulfide in water, the sulfide is going to attack the water immediately to form hydroxide. And so this is the leveling effect of strong bases. Strong bases hydrolyze water uh, completely to form hydroxide. Uh, <clears throat> phosphate uh, doesn't hydrolyze completely. Let's say sulfide hydrolyzes 100%. Phosphate would hydrolyze about 50%. And so it form a lot less hydroxide than um, sulfide would. But still, phosphate's a decent uh, base. You know, It's not the most powerful base, but it's a decent base. Since it's not the most powerful base, then um, what acids will it react with? Will it react with every single acid there is? And uh, the list goes on. Well, what's the conjugate acid of, of phosphate? What's the conjugate acid of phosphate? HPO4 2 minus is correct. That's the conjugate acid. And so we have um, acids that are weaker and we have acids that are stronger than HPO4 2 minus. Well, let's just look at HPO4 2 minus. If we look at HPO4 2 minus, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this. This is my acid. This is my base. And so this is a Bronsted acid base reaction. The acid donates a proton. The base accepts a proton. So if that's my acid, it donates a proton to form PO4. And so this loses an H plus, so the charge is going to change to 3 minus. This one's going to accept an H plus, and so I'm going to get HPO4. And the charge, well, if I have a positive and three negatives, it's going to come out to um, two negatives. And take a look at this reaction. Do you, think, um, do you think monohydrogen phosphate is going to be an effective acid to neutralize my phosphate? So uh, this is an acid-base reaction. You, do you think monohydrogen phosphate is pretty effective at neutralizing phosphate, my base? So let's say I have some phosphate, you know. This phosphate solution is going to be um, pretty basic because what happens is phosphate hydrolyzes water about 50% and this creates a lot of hydroxide. So <clears throat> if you feel a, like a sodium phosphate solution, it's very slippery, like sodium hydroxide. Have you ever felt a sodium hydroxide solution? Very slippery. <coughs> phosphate, same, very slippery. It creates a lot of hydroxide. And so I know that this is kind of basic, you know, pretty basic. Um, pH should be pretty high. pH is high for bases. And so I want to neutralize that. I'm going to use, can I pick any old acid? I'm going to pick this acid. I'm going to neutralize my phosphate. Am I going to be successful? Will I be successful? No, I'm not going to be successful because look at the products. What do you notice about the products? It's the same thing. Did neutralization occur here or, or partial? No. In fact, there's pretty much no reaction. There is a reaction because we can't stop this from reacting. I mean, if we were to label this, you know, there's, uh, there's P32 is a radioactive isotope of phosphorus. We can label this one with P32. This one would be normal P31, which is not radioactive. We'd see that this one would uh, lose the proton in some of the collisions. So we might start off with this, but what's going to happen is it's going to get all mixed up because they're just going to be swapping the proton back and forth. But essentially, it's no, no net reaction, so we'll just call it NR, no reaction. And so what that means is that monohydrogen phosphate is not strong enough to neutralize this. That means we need an acid that's weaker or an acid that's stronger. stronger. We need a, a stronger acid. And so what we say is that phosphate will react with any acid, any of these acids, that's stronger than monohydrogen phosphate. But if we have an acid that's weaker than monohydrogen phosphate, or if we have monohydrogen phosphate itself, then we're going to get no reaction. And <clears throat> we could do this. If we did this, we, we'd go from, you know, 
if we pick an acid that's stronger, we're going to go from stronger acid to weaker acid. If we pick a, an acid that's weaker, we're going to go from a weaker to stronger, which is not a driving force. And so we could use the chart rapidly to tell me what acids uh, will, this will react with, and they're a bunch. And so it might not react with monohydrogen phosphate, but it certainly will react with dihydrogen phosphate or nitrous acid or acetic acid, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a whole bunch of acids that this will react with favorably. And so um, it's a base, and it reacts with any acid stronger than monohydrogen phosphate. Okay, that's Bronsted. And then um, we go to redox properties. If we look at the redox properties, uh, what can we say about sodium ion? Is it an oxidizer or a reducer, sodium ion? Yeah, this is an oxidizer, and it's very weak. Even though it's a weak oxidizer, sodium ions can react. Um, in fact, if, if we look at the table, we can do the same thing here. Sodium ions are weak oxidizer. The strongest oxidizer is what? Fluorine or fluoride? Fluorine. And so if this is my oxidizer, is fluoride a good reducer here? Do you think fluoride can do you think sodium ions can take electrons away from fluoride? They got in some tug of war, sodium versus fluorine, tug of war for electrons, who's gonna win? Fluoride will win. And so any reduce, well, what about sodium? If sodium got in a tug of war with sodium, would there be a winner? No, and so what you need is, these are weaker reducing agents, these are stronger reducing agents. And so what you need in order to react with sodium ions is you need a stronger reducing agent than sodium metal. And what's a stronger reducing agent than sodium metal? Like lithium metal? Lithium metal will work. Potassium metal will work. And so these species will react. But these species are <coughs> very reactive, very dangerous. And so sodium ions are essentially unreactive, unless you have an, an exotic um, very powerful reducer. And so it's quite weak. How about phosphate? Is phosphate on the chart? No, phosphate's not on the chart, but you would expect phosphate to be an oxidizer or reducer. What do you expect? <coughs> oxidizer? Yeah? Or reducer? Oxidizer. Phosphate should be an oxidizer. Um, why? It's electron poor. What makes it electron poor? The oxygen or the phosphorus? Okay, making phosphorus what charge? Plus. Plus four is not right. Plus. <laughs> plus five. Phosphorus is plus five. We've seen plus five before. We saw plus five in a powerful oxidizer, which was the uh, nitrate. And so, is it going to be comparable in strength to nitrate? Should phosphate and nitrate be on the same level because they're both plus five? No, they aren't on the same level. For example, um, phosphorus versus nitrogen, which one's bigger, phosphorus atom or nitrogen atom? Phosphorus is bigger, nitrogen's smaller. So if you have plus five on a nitrogen, is it the same thing as a plus five on a phosphorus? <coughs> no, what's different? The charge density. The charge density is going to be much higher. So I, I, I wouldn't expect phosphate to be uh, as reactive as nitrate. Nitrate should be more reactive. 
But how reactive is phosphate? Should phosphate just be right under there? And so there are some clues. The clues are the observations. One, is phosphate a common chemical? Yes. Common chemical, but do you see it on the redox chart? No. And so what does that tell you? It's a common chemical, but it doesn't appear on the redox chart, which tells me that, do we worry much about the redox properties of phosphate? No. We don't, and so that, um, that means that it's likely not a very strong oxidizer. That's what it means, especially since sulfate's on the chart. If you look at sulfate, sulfate's on the chart, sulfur is plus six, and sulfate's not that strong either. And so phosphate's probably there. But be careful, because there are some things not on the chart that are powerful. Um, reducers or powerful oxidizers uh, like uh, for example ethanol you know ethanol is a powerful reducer it's not on the chart no. but something like this an inorganic like phosphate it, it seems out of place it should be on that chart it's not phosphates on the acid base chart for sure it's not and so you know I would um, conclude based on that that it's a weak oxidizer and so the redox properties for sodium phosphate are uninteresting. It's very unreactive in a redox. I mean, it could, of course, but it's not. And so when you look at sodium phosphate, what stands out are the metathesis properties of phosphate and the base properties of phosphate. Sodium ions are, are pretty unreactive. That is... Um, versus something like sodium metal. Sodium metal is very reactive. All right. Well, that's what, uh, we did Bronsted acid base. This is what the chart is here, Bronsted acid base. Lewis acid base are much uh, more complicated. We have to take Lewis acid base reactions case by case, usually, when we look at those individually. Um, sometimes we can group them. Like One of the types of reactions that we can group together is uh, is this one. And so we're going to move on to chapter 24 now. Chapter 24, uh, we're looking at uh, complexes. And it turns out the formation of complexes um, occurs via a Lewis acid base reaction. And so uh, one of the Lewis acid base reactions is like this. If I take gold, 3 plus, and then add four chlorides to this, um, <coughs> This turns out to be a, a Lewis acid base reaction. And I, I just said, is chloride a very good base? No. no. But I shouldn't have said that. I should say, is chloride a very good Bronsted base? Then, yes, uh, the answer would be no. It's not a very good Bronsted base. But a chloride could be a, a Lewis base. And in fact, that's what it's acting as here. It's a Lewis base, and it's a decent Lewis base in this uh, reaction. And so if I have some gold 3 here, gold 3 is going to be my Lewis acid. Chloride is going to be my Lewis base. And so the reaction is like this. I take a gold 3, um, which is the acid. Acids are proton, uh, not proton, donors. What are acids in Lewis? Electron pair acceptors. And bases are electron pair donors. So chloride here going to look like this, minus. And uh, what's going to happen is um, there's going to be a reaction here. So with this electron pair, it's going to react. And um, normally we would think it, it's going to form an ionic compound. You know, typically you, you'd say this should form gold-3 chloride, right? And gold-3 chloride should be an ionic compound, gold-3 chloride. But it, it doesn't in this case, because what happens is this bond turns out to be a covalent bond, like this. So, and it turns out that it doesn't stop at one, and it doesn't stop at three. Eventually what we're gonna get on here are four chlorides covalently bonded to the gold.
All right, now, um, for complexes, okay, so that's the first one, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. So we'll just keep repeating this. And then we stop at four. And so for complexes, uh, let me tell you, um, and that's what this is. It's the product of this Lewis acid base reaction between a, a metal cation and a, an anion like this. Um, it doesn't happen for uh, like uh, sodium ions, for example. Sodium ions, you know, those aren't very good Lewis acid. <coughs> the group one, group one cations don't do this kind of complexing. It's the same thing with group two. It doesn't really do this. Group two just forms normal ionic compounds. It's when you get to these transition metal cations, which are very small and have a high charge density, that we see this. And so we'll form something like this, which is a very strange um, species here. To better understand a, a species like this, we'd like to think in terms of uh, like formal charge. Um, formal charge. Formal charges, ignore these. Okay, because if we did the formal charges, over there chloride is minus, but here the chlorine would be zero because in formal charge, we assume the bonding is what? When we're counting formal charge, we assume the bonding is 100% covalent. And so that would bring the charge on chlorine to, to zero. And then the charge on gold would change as well. But we ignore the formal charges. And in other words, what we're going to do is we're going to just pretend the charges didn't change. So gold is still 3 plus. It wouldn't because now it's got a whole bunch of extra electrons. And, and, and now chlorine, these chlorines are not zero. These chlorines are all going to be negative 1. And so uh, if these chlorines are all negative 1, then um, we don't usually show the negative 1s there. We just usually show the gold. Then negative 4 plus 3 gives us a net negative charge here. Be it. And uh, the second thing about complexes is uh, this. Valence bond theory fails. Valence bond theory would tell you what, what's the structure in this complex. Uh, valence bond theory would say it's tetrahedral because something that comes out of valence bond theory, which is Vesper, a Vesper says, uh, let's figure out how many groups of electrons are around gold. It says four groups of electrons means it should be tetrahedral with four bonded atoms. Um, but it's not. You know what the structure of this is? The structure of this is square planar. It's not tetrahedral. And so square planar, it's just flat like this. Why is that? Is, that? is there a lone pair above here and a lone pair below there? No. No lone pair above, no lone pair below. The reason is, is valence bond theory fails. So valence bond theory fails, for, and it fails for complexes in general. We can't use valence bond theory for complexes. Then what do we use? If we don't use valence bond theory, we have to use what? Molecular orbital theory. Now, what's the difference between valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory? Yeah, how hard it is. Which one's harder? Yeah, molecular orbital. So we, our preference is to use valence bond because it's easier. But is that the only thing that's, hard, that's different? What's the difference between valence bond and molecular orbital? Accuracy. Accuracy, right. Accuracy. Accuracy with what? How the orbital accuracy look. Yeah, right. The electron clouds, how they look. Also the energies. Valence bond theory tells us nothing about higher energy, excited states. The spectra, you know, the um, spectrum of this molecule, we wouldn't be able to figure out using valence bond theory. In other words, um, they're both based on quantum mechanics. If they're both ba based on quantum mechanics, then why are they so different? <coughs> yeah. 
Why don't we just get rid of it? Well, because of the difficulty, but why is it more difficult? Why is molecular orbital more difficult than valence bond? <coughs> And so, this, well, this is a major fail for valence bond theory. We can't. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll, if, if we if we try to use valence bond theory, we'd say, oh, those are um, those look like sp3, sp3 sigma bonds. Those aren't sp3, sp3 sigma bonds because we don't think in terms of valence bond theory for this. We we think in terms of MO theory. MO theory applied to complexes is called um, ligand field theory, but. The difference is uh, one of these is a simplified um, version of quantum mechanics in which the bond is treated as the overlap of the wave functions for the orbitals. We're looking at orbital overlap, whereas um, MO theory is a more rigorous approach, in which the bond is looked at as having more bonding density than anti-bonding density in the we have an LCAO of uh, atomic orbitals. Do you remember the LCAO? LCAO is the central theme of uh, molecular orbital theory. LCAO stands for what? Yeah, linear combination uh, of the atomic orbitals. And so if we did that, and then we do this, and then we, we get a much better picture of what's happening with the structure yeah. and the bonding in this complex. But valence bond theory is still useful because, you know, it, um, it's kind of close to MO, but not exactly for some types of information. But we have to be aware of two spectacular fails for valence bond theory. One is complexes. What's the other spectacular fail for valence bond theory? With this fail, you would think they would abandon valence bond, but MO is just too, too difficult sometimes. What was the other major fail for valence bond theory? <coughs> this is not Chem 1B, Chem 1A. The valence bond theory. Mm, not that. The other spectacular fail is for something we breathe in every day. Super important molecule for life. Oxygen. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, dia versus paramagnetic. Valence bond theory is a spectacular fail there. You know, and so you would have thought they would have abandoned valence bond right then, but it hasn't. Here's another fail for valence bond, but still valence bonds. You know, we still use valence bond um, for molecules, even though it failed for O2. You know, for nitrogen, it comes out okay or somewhat, you know, close. But we never use valence bond for complexes. Never. Even you know because it just it doesn't work. And so, um, yeah. Don't apply it. Now we can only fit four of these uh, here around here. And so there are other ones. Um, do you recall the name of this? Yeah, tetrachloroborate's close. You're missing one thing. What are you missing? The Roman numeral three. All right, now I want you to do the same thing for aluminum. Aluminum is going to be your acid, and now we're going to attach six 
waters to this in sequence. And so tell me what we formed here and, and how you draw it out. So uh, give that a shot. Normally what we think of in, in aluminum 3 plus is a cation and then we should set up ion dipole interactions here. And so we have the ion, the full charge here, being attracted to the dipole water by an ion dipole attraction. We'll just show us this. But in, in this case that uh, interaction is very strong. In fact, um, you know, if this were like a sodium ion or magnesium ion or or something like that, we, we would just expect an ion dipole. Because the charge density isn't so high, but the charge density on aluminum is very high. It's a very small cation with a high charge. It turns out that interaction is much stronger. And so what this looks like after six of these attach to the aluminum is we get a structure that looks like this. Now we retain the charge on aluminum, so it's just three plus, and then we just add the waters, but here, water will be electron pair donor to aluminum, and we're going to form a covalent bond here. And so like gold, we would expect an ionic bond. What we end up with is a covalent bond. And so now we're going to have a covalently bonded water. If you look at the formal charge on oxygen, what is it? Plus one. But do we worry about formal charges in complexes? No, we don't. We're going to completely ignore it. And so I'm going to do a wedge dash diagram like this. And uh, it turns out I can fit six. Now, how many I can fit just depends on, you know, the uh, quantum mechanics, the bonding here, or the space of the sides that I have around here. So here's five. Six. It's six waters around there. Since I ignore formal charge, then that means that the aluminum is still three plus, and the waters, even though they should be positive, the waters are going to be neutral, zero charge. 
And so if I have six waters, each neutral, and one aluminum three plus, the total charge on this is gonna be three plus. Now, <clears throat> the difference here between the hydrated ion, the hydrated ion just has ion dipole, those are intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces, even though the ion dipole can be quite strong, are still very weak compared to an actual covalent bond. Here, in this case, is we've got an actual covalent bond here, it's gonna be strong, so these waters are, are attached. It doesn't mean the waters can't be broken off, they can, but um, these waters are bonded now to the one of three plus. Not, and you'd expect it, you know, well, anyway, um, if, we, if we did formal charges, all the oxygens would be, would be a plus, and the aluminum would be one, two, three, four, five, six. Aluminum now has six electrons. It was plus three, so now it's gonna be minus three. But anyway, if we did the formal charges, it would still add up to three plus. We aren't gonna do it that way because of the name. Do you know what we call this complex here? This complex is called, uh, what would you guess? 